In the last episode, I flew to Wallington, New Jersey to get this 1960 Impala running and driving after sitting for 25 plus years. It took five solid days to get this thing roadworthy and get on the road. I've made it my first 100 miles to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and my first stop is the Bethlehem Steelworks that's been abandoned and repurposed. So let's check some of this out. This whole complex here used to be Bethlehem Steelworks. I think Bethlehem made their last steel in the 90s before foreign steel pretty much took over. And all these buildings, this building, that building, um, all of those buildings, this all used to be part of Bethlehem Steelworks. But check this out. This is freaking cool, man. Bethlehem Steel has roots going back to 1850, but this geographical location was perfect because they were close to rail, they were close to rivers for transportation of goods, and they were also close to natural resources like iron ore. The blast furnaces you're looking at saw tens of thousands of tons pass through them to build the steel that built America throughout the late 1800s and the 1900s, all the way up until 1995 when the last blast furnace was shut off for good. And what is it exactly that Bethlehem Steel produced? They had innovations in steel rail making to replace wrought iron steel rail with the Bessemer steel rail, which was a much longer lasting rail. Bethlehem Steel also innovated steel beams that made skyscrapers possible, and it basically pushed New York City skyward instead of outward. The Chrysler Building, which was completed in 1930, had 20,291 tons of Bethlehem Steel H-beams in it, and it is still the tallest standing brick building in the world. Ore would travel up these tracks all the way to the top of the blast furnace where it would be dumped in the top and then hot air would be blasted into it to create the steel. Bethlehem Steel also made things for the military like armor plate like this that was able to stop a massive shell. Bethlehem had contracts with the United States and other countries like Japan, Britain, Russia, and Latin America. With the conglomeration of all these major contracts for steel for war efforts from multiple countries, it put Bethlehem Steel in the top five largest companies in the United States. Bethlehem Steel ran 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it employed at its height 30,000 people, which was about half of the city, I believe, at the time. Working at Bethlehem was also sort of a culture. You can see here the names and even some of the nicknames of the men welded into the catwalk here down below. And right above me here, you can see this giant pipe would carry the compressed air. And these engines are what made it happen. Each one of these flywheels is connected to an engine that would compress the air to 25 to 30 PSI, send it through these giant pipes all the way out of this room. That giant steel pipe in front of me would carry it to each of the five blast furnaces to be used in the steel making process. Every single one of these used to be steam engines but were converted to gas engines in the early 1900s once internal combustion engines became popular. And these are the carts that would carry the ore in buckets on rails to the blast furnace that it needed to be at for the steel making process. Yeah, but look though, I think it's cool man, that old wooden door, old handle still on it where some guy would be controlling that car. There's the handle in there. Somebody was actually in there manning that handle. That kind of stuff fascinates me. And now here it lays idle. This one you can still see, I think, some of the iron pellets. Uh, it's almost like they just walked away. I mean, it looks like it's just waiting to be used again. And this building right here is the number two machine shop built in 1890. This was one of the largest industrial buildings in the world, stretching for nearly a third of a mile. Workers in this shop milled and drilled Bethlehem steel into finished products and parts including weapons, ammo, and ships. In 1943, Bethlehem steel made one entire naval ship per day out of this building. Although the trains still roll by the Bethlehem steel plant, they no longer deliver the raw materials used at this behemoth, almost four mile long complex that built so much of America. And back to the car, uh, just going to check everything out real quick, make sure there's no leaks, no radiator fluid, no engine oil, tranny fluid, none of that. 
That looks pretty clean underneath. Cleaner than some new cars even, which is pretty wild. We'll go ahead and hook the battery up and then we can get on the road. We got a long way to go. And one last word on Bethlehem Steel. You know, a lot of people wonder how something that was so integral and important to the American economy could go bankrupt like that. Well, uh, it was a series of things over many decades, actually. A ballooning corporate structure, added bureaucracy that didn't matter, the advent of the EPA in the 70s and 80s, an unwillingness to change with the times because they thought their success in the past would forever continue into the future. And some would also say piling union demands made them uncompetitive. So I decided to finally stop for the night. My taillights quit working on the car. I didn't want to get pulled over. I couldn't get them to work. If you remember, I'll show you. So my headlight switch is messing up. I was taking power from the backup lights and running them over to the, uh, the tail lights and the fuse blew because I was trying to use too much power off of one fuse. I tried to fix it on the side of the highway, couldn't get it to work. Need some new fuses or a new headlight switch. One of them isn't working. Let me tell you something. I looked for the nearest hotel. I found a Quality Inn and a Hampton Inn right next to each other. I go to the Quality Inn. How much is your basic low rent room? $155. Okay, I'll just go to the Hampton Inn and see what they got. Go in there. Say, what's your uh, most low rent room, sir? I just need something to sleep in. He said $155, $154. I said, gosh, dang, for a room? These aren't my kind of people, man. So around the bend, back behind the bushes, almost in the same parking lot, is Browns Hill Tavern and Motel. I called just before I got in the parking lot and I said, how much is your room? $83. I said, that's me right there. And I walk in the bar that the bartender was the same one who sold me the room. One of their front door glasses cracked. I think I'm in the right spot. I don't need quality in. I just need an in. I kind of feel like the Bates Motel where, you know, the hotel is one place and the house is in the other place. You should have to follow this road right up to where you're staying. Room 121. A real key. Wouldn't you know it. Oh. Door's already open, it wasn't even locked. Oh. Looks like there's people already. Oh, wrong room. Just kidding, just kidding. Whoopsies. Okay, it's really it. <laughs> anyway. Well, good morning, guys. We made it 223 successful miles yesterday without any major incident except for the taillight situation last night. Uh, but today we got to get to Mansfield, Ohio. I want to go to the Ohio State Reformatory, which is where they filmed Shawshank Redemption. And I want to check that out. I think that'll be cool. Um, right now I'm checking fluids, checking the car out, checking vitals, seeing if, if we're good to go. A few things I want to check out, I'll show you. Oh, one, first off, I want to look underneath the car and uh, I don't really see any leaks uh, coming out. But one thing is, is this hose keeps collapsing. Um, whenever I shut the car off, uh, watch when I undo this hose. I'm not sure if that radiator cap is bad or what, but it's not trying to overheat on me. But when I shut it off and it cools down, it. Um, hose collapses so I'm gonna put a new radiator cap on and I just I'd had this with me in case I needed it we're not really losing any water so I don't know I'll stick that on there and I don't know see if that changes anything and we could add a little bit and it's dirty it's probably so dirty cuz um, I put new oil in it but it's probably taken all the sludge from uh, what was in there and bring it to the bottom. And I don't think it's burning oil because I don't really see a lot of smoke coming out, but if you look at the valve covers, or I'm sorry, if you look at the head, see how they're a little wet down there? I think the valve cover uh, gasket's leaking a little bit. It's not so much to be a major concern to me. Yeah, carburetor's working so much better. Things running like an absolute top now. Um, ran just perfect yesterday. Check our brake fluid. I don't think it's losing any. Brakes seem to be working dandy. Yeah. Yeah, brake fluid's at the very, very tip top. So I didn't do too bad on the brakes. Give her about a, I don't know, quarter or so. Let her drink on that and 
She'll be good. Just keep an eye on her, you know. Check the power steering. Power steering's working great. I don't know why it had no fluid in it when I originally was working on this car. I hooked the belt up, put fluid in it, and <clears throat> hasn't leaked any out. See, that power steering's working great too. Like butter. Generator's still charging. If you remember the last episode, I had a fiasco getting this thing apart, fixing the brush. The, the brush spring was broke. Let's see if she'll fire up sitting overnight. A few pumps for good luck. Oh man. That's a small block for you, baby. Don't you love that? That's perfect. So I'm getting gas. The last place we well, the last place we filled up at was 150 miles ago exactly. Okay, eight gallons, 150 miles. Let me do the math on that. That's 18.75 miles to the gallon. I've clocked it twice now, 18 miles to the gallon. That is way better than I thought it was gonna be. I was assuming 12 to 15, 18, that's great. On 15 gallons, we could go 270 miles in between stops if we really wanted to. Probably two to 250 is all you'd really wanna go, but that's really good. That's a lot better than having two five gallon jerry cans in the uh, seat. I stopped on the highway to check some things and I noticed that my heater core is leaking uh, antifreeze. I think what happened was I put that new cap on and now it's able to hold more pressure and uh, it, it gave way to the uh, heater core. You can see it's dripping some fluid down there. And you can see it's dripping in here. What's crazy is if I would have left that radiator cap on there, probably would have never had any problems, you know what I mean? Maybe I should just put that cap back on there and keep going. You gotta cap it off now. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Gotta cap this heater core off now that it finally decided to let loose. Oh, gosh! I'm gonna see if this half inch extension, cause these hoses are two different sizes. One heater hose I think is uh, half and one is five eighths or something like that. I can't remember, but the heater hoses are two different sizes. So you can't loop one and into the other. <sighs> I know you're gonna start bleeding. like that'll fit. See, this side's bigger so it fits over the end that goes on the ratchet. The shaft is smaller which goes over the smaller hose. <coughs> there you go. Tighten that up.
I'm convinced that you did this. You did this to me. I'm not gonna have you hold more pressure and then blow this out. I cannot afford that. Much, much, much better. I gotta see where it's plugged at. I wanna spray some brake clean down it and crank it and see if you start seeing fuel come up in this fuel uh, filter. Probably take a few... I've never tried before. What's up? Brake clean. Or brake, brake clean? Yeah. Lights them off real good. What's up? WD-40. Oh, you, you spray that down in there? Yeah, the regular fish oil one, not that silicone okay. cap. Same thing. Oh, okay. I never have tried that. Getting there, but it's a long time, I suppose. Hey, it's back in business, though. I mean, it wouldn't be running this long if it wasn't pulling. Wes? Yeah. I'm Travis. I really appreciate you stopping. Just to check up and everything, man. Hey, shout out to Wes, man. Thank you for stopping, man. That means a lot. There's still good people in this world, man. We lost a lot of time, but hey, it had to be done. The line was kinked. Driving down the highway and it stopped midstream. It sounded like it just puttered out. I just put gas in it. I noticed there was one hose, one fuel hose, close to the engine that I didn't see that I didn't replace, and it looked collapsed. I had to jack the car up to get to it. I couldn't get to it uh, flat on the ground. I replaced that hose. Well, I blew through it, and it was clogged still. I replaced that hose anyway, but one of the hoses closer to the tank that I did, it was kinked. So I, I cut it, made it shorter to where it, to where it wouldn't kink, and now it's running good. Anyway, let's get back on the road. So since my plans are foiled of going to the uh, reformatory where Shawshank Redemption was filmed, I stopped at this O'Reilly's before dark to try and see if I can fix these tail lights, and uh, I'll show you what I did. So I got some fuses and spades, and uh, that fuse blew last night, uh, I think I told you. So I put a little bit stronger fuse in, and I just you know, jumped it from that fuse to that fuse to give it power, because that fuse is not getting power. And um, so I gave it power that way, and now, uh, now we have tail lights. It's hard to see in the daylight. You can see I got tail lights now. We got tail lights, brake lights, signals, everything again. And we can just keep on rolling. Redemption was 
out the way you want them to, but it's fine. It's probably like 370 miles away. If I get there, I'll be there at like 12, 1 o'clock. A little while ago, it tried to vapor lock on me. Uh, vapor lock is where the, the fuel boils in the gas lines, and uh, the fuel pump can't pump it because it's a vapor. Uh, the fuel pump can only pump liquid. And I unhooked the speedometer because it's a little wire that turns in the speedometer and it, it moves your needle. And uh, they put lube in them from the factory, but that lube hardens up over time and then it screeches. Hopefully when it gets dark here we'll have lights, but you never know. These old cars switch up on you for minute to minute. I'm getting people giving me all kinds of thumbs up, honking. Uh, I was at a rest stop last night. And I was backing out and some people in a car were like, hey, honk your horn, man. Can you honk your horn? I was like, sure. And they were like, man, that thing is so cool. So I stopped to get some gas and I noticed something reflecting off the gas handle. And lo and behold, the license plate light was working, which is an anomaly to me. I don't know how that could be. And I always get comments from people from other countries kind of being interested in what's going on over here and driving these old cars on the road. And I just still don't think people <laughs> understand how big America is. I mean, Germany from east to west is 450 miles long, the entire country. I was on one stretch of one highway for 377 miles. That's one stretch of one highway. It's much longer than that in its entirety. Israel is only, I think, 85 miles wide at its widest point. In total, our highway system has over 4 million miles, over double that of China, even though China has triple our population. And we're only about 3% larger by landmass. There's never a shortage of things to discover here in the States. The power steering belt kept on slacking off and I kept adjusting it out until I couldn't anymore. And so I put the, the new belt I bought on it right now. So this belt I just found in the seat, it had the wrapping on it and I put it on and the generator belt, but uh, I don't know, I guess it's old or something and it's just slacked off and stretched out to where it wouldn't adjust anymore. So I put my new belt on it, adjusted it. Now that's doing fine. My The pump was squeaking, the belt was squeaking. That I was scared that belt was gonna come loose and bust my radiator or something. So I checked the oil, it was about a quart low and I put a quart in it. I think it's burning some oil, uh, some blow by coming out of the, the oil fill hole and out of the breather tube at the bottom. I think I've gone eight, nine hundred miles so far and it's only used two quarts of oil. I'd take that any day. Uh, my radiator's still good to go. It hasn't blown yet. And I've been feeling around the hubs, you know, just touching them to see if they're warm. And I packed the bearings good, I guess, because they're nice and cool, not even lukewarm. And I come around here, I touch this backing plate and that hub and everything, and that's good. Um, but the one over here is hot to the touch. I. Uh, Check the differential fluid and differential fluid was full, plumb full. So since one of them is hot and not the other, it could be that that side is either not getting oil or that I have the brakes adjusted too far out and it's um, just dragging on the drum. So I'm going to jack the back up a little bit now and uh, just rotate that drum and see if I need to adjust it out. It's warm to the touch now. It was it was kind of hot to the touch, but that's with how many miles under our belt today? Hundreds. So I'm not really sure what to do about that at the moment. Full of differential oil, and it's not even dragging the drum. Yeah, this side too. Not even dragging. Just checking. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. All right, guys. Well, it is Monday now. Saturday night, I got into Mount Vernon. Uh, stayed with some family. I appreciate uh, my Aunt Janice for letting me stay with her, feeding me some biscuits and gravy. Real good. Got to see some family. I was here all day Sunday. Uh, I just clocked out on Sunday. Since I got to New Jersey last Friday, uh, I, I haven't stopped at all. So uh, by Sunday, which was about nine days in, I called it quits for a day. So I stayed here yesterday on Sunday, vegetated, posted the first half of the video that you guys have probably seen already. 
And now that it's Monday, it's like eight o'clock, we can start on the road again from Southern Illinois, uh, down the way to Amarillo. So we'll be passing through, I think St. Louis, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, down to Amarillo. I want to go to Cadillac Ranch, uh, but we're still full of coolant. A lot of people in my previous video said that I should lube it up because there's lube ports, and I did. I just didn't do it on camera, but there's a lube port here, and then there's one in the back here. So I did spritz some lube in there so she doesn't burn up. Yeah, we're to full on the brake fluid. We're good on the oil. It's dark, and I know why it's dark, because there's still sludge in there, you know what I mean, from sitting 30 years. Let's just see if anything's on there. Yeah, we're reading some. Might need to check it again when it's hot, though. I've ran it about 1,000 miles. We've gone about 950 miles. I kind of wanted to drop the oil drop the filter and put a new one in it. But I'm on rocks here and the car is too low to get to uh, the filter and the differential, it's just too low. And I got nowhere, that's the street. <laughs> I can't jack it up in the rocks. So I maybe have to find a rest stop or something to do those two things at. Anyway, I've had breakfast, really nothing left to do but to do it. Oh, I haven't ran this car since Saturday night. And again, it's Monday, so give her a few spritz of the foot and see if she lights off. Perfect. I love small blocks. To be just doing that, I'm impressed. I mean, you've gotta be impressed by that. Listen to how it runs, too. She was sputtering in the beginning, but listen to it now. Not a vibration, one. I was also getting some comments about asphyxiation, that I, you know, because of the exhaust, it had a bunch of holes in it. The exhaust comes out right there, and I got a rust hole the size of Texas in my rear floor. There's a bunch of rust holes in the exhaust leading back up to the front, so people were worried that, you know, I was asphyxiating myself. I've gone 950 miles and I'm just fine, and two, I got the windows down. There's, there's airflow galore going on in that cab, okay? There's... It's, it's not like I got the windows up and a hose running in the cab, you know what I mean? I mean, there's so much airflow that I'm getting enough fresh air, right? Don't worry about my fresh air situation. If I seem to get tired, I'll pull over and shut the car off.
talk about America. I'm in the middle of Missouri. Got some fried okra. Some fried mozzarella sticks. And to top it all off, a big old piece of fried catfish. After I eat this, we'll fill up, see what our gas mileage is. Continue to hit the road. We've went 194 miles since this morning. Um, we'll see how much gas she uses. We're gonna calculate our fuel mileage once again. So she quit at 12.3 gallons. That's 192 miles divided by 12.3. I did the math, that's like 15.6 miles a gallon. I don't know what happened to you. You were doing better earlier. I just got outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, on my way to Oklahoma City. I've gone about 460, 470 miles so far today. I got an interesting story about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Some of you might know about this, some of you might not, but uh, back in 1957, Tulsa, Oklahoma put a brand new 1957 Belvedere and they buried it like a time capsule and they were gonna unearth it after 50 years, so 2007. And they had a few people put some valuables inside the car, you know, uh, like keepsakes. Well, they, they dug up the 57 Belvedere, brand new, zero miles, called, the, it was uh, an event called the Tulsa Rama. They did it in 2007. I was there in 2007 when they dug it up. I was 10 years old, I'm 26 now. But me and my mom and dad, we were on our way to Illinois for a family, you know, from Tucson. And it was happening around the same time, so my dad wanted to see it. They wanted to see him dig it up. So we went, and we saw him dig it up, and they had a cover over it until, it, until they transported it to uh, an arena where everybody could see it. It was this whole big event. And believe it or not, a few of the people who put some stuff in the car in 1957 were there. They were really old, but some, a few of them were there. And when they took the cover off of it, that car was trashed. They did not seal that concrete box up for crap. It's totally rusted out. I mean, it might as well have had 100,000 miles on it and then parked in a field, you know? It was totally trashed. And uh, when I was passing through Tulsa, I kind of wanted to see that car, if they had it on display somewhere, you know, because I saw it in 07 when they dug it up. That was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Uh, but it's oddly enough at some museum in uh, Roscoe, Illinois, which is like Northern Illinois. I don't know why it's up there and not in Tulsa. All right, so we made it to Oklahoma City, made it about 590 miles today. Um, I was trying to make it to Amarillo, but that's kind of a stretch. I was trying to get to that halfway point uh, where I started off today was 1,700 miles from home. I was hoping to make it 800 so I can do the other 700 tomorrow, but it's not looking like that. Uh, she couldn't quite get her done. And also, this hub is getting hot is what's worrying me too. That's why I also wanted to stop and not you know, drive through the night. I mean, I started off at nine and it's 10, so that's 13 hours of driving anyway. This hub over here is not getting oil or something because it is warm, it is radiating heat, and it is hot to the touch. I mean hot. It's not making any noise yet, um, but uh, she's uh, giving way maybe, I don't know. And this side is, is not warm at all. I mean maybe lukewarm, not even hot. So we made it here and we'll see you bright and early tomorrow. All right guys, good morning. I'm doing my morning due diligence. All our fluids are looking good, except for the oil. The oil is half a core low, maybe. It is using a little bit of oil. I see it coming out the breather tube, you know. So we're gonna dump some, the rest of my Marvel mystery oil in it, and a little bit of engine oil, keep it going. Uh, I was talking to my dad about it last night, 
and he said that it's um, it doesn't get oil from the rear end that he seems to think that it's like a sealed uh, bearing so you know it's getting hot maybe because that that grease inside the bearing is getting old um, but it's not leaking differential fluid out of the out of the hub so I don't know well what is all this am I leaking gas I lost the gas cap and I just put the plate up it could be sloshing and putting gas out of the, the neck there I uh, didn't put the cap on when I left the gas station last night so whatever I still have the old gas tank in here although uh, could be leaking some fuel out of that old gas tank so I don't know I'm telling you fixes all problems you can use this as two-stroke oil you can use it to get stuck bolts loose you can use it as fuel additive you can use it as oil additive this this is like fix all for everything I don't care what anyone says I love this stuff like a moth to a flame baby I found you I sure found you didn't I mm. Yeah, there's more and more wind power generation going on and I don't know if they make a deal with these farmers to like, you know, put that windmill there and give them part of the profits or what? Well, uh, I think I ran out of gas, man. I'm about four miles from a loves I think but it's that way the opposite way I'm going so I'm crossing the highway that sucks maybe I can thumb down a ride or something I don't know four miles it's not too bad I'm gonna lose a few hours though that's for sure so I'll keep you guys updated you can barely see it I think it's about four miles away way up there can't believe I did that man I should have stopped but I've only went 183 miles from the last fill up so I should have been good I uh, I looked so I don't know what a rookie mistake I think this guy stopped for me up here <laughs> thank God I think he stopped for me. Thank you, Lord. Man, just by chance, this hotshot trucker was going up to the same gas station I was trying to get to, so lucked out right big there. time, man. And there's like a berm right there to turn around on. It happens to the best, though. So, brother, I love uh, old school. You're going to have to get all that... Uh, rust Rondo repair? Rust repair. <laughs> yeah, it rusted out pretty good. Anything northeast with all that salt and stuff. I'm just hoping that this is enough for that pickup tube in the tank to pick up on. Try, try it again. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna get back to that gas station and fill up this and my other tank. Only a few miles from that gas station, so. We'll just turn around in this berm. Yeah, I am more than grateful for him stopping. I actually tried to uh, try my chances at calling an Uber out there. I mean, that was a waste of time, but hey, I tried it. I did flip him a few bucks for helping me out, you know, took time out of his day. He's a hot shot trucker, so his time is valuable. So uh, yeah, man, got me out of a bind. Made it to Texas though.
So I stopped over here in this empty parking lot because I think I can start hearing that Baron make some noise. And also I wanted to check this gas tank and look at this thing. There it is. You see how it gets wet when I wipe it? Right there. It's cracked. Piece of junk. I jacked it up so the wheels are off the ground because one wheel gets driven, okay, by the engine. One wheel is the is the wheel that gets the, all the power. And I and this one's been getting all the power. It's been getting hot. So I put it in drive and that wheel started spinning and I put that jug under the wheel so the power would shift to the other wheel. And hopefully that saves us. See if I take this. Start turning that other one. Hopefully that saves this, this bearing. Well, we made it to where I wanted to go. Cadillac Ranch. Crazy. I guess the guy that put these here wanted to show the evolution of Cadillacs through the years. It's hard to even tell with all the paint on them, but like this is the earliest one and they go later and later all the way till I don't know what year. They're painted, right? Look at that. That is layers and layers of paint that have just fallen off the roof onto the ground. That's all paint. That's all paint. Look, the window regulator is still in the window. I'll have to do some more research and see like how complete these were when they put them in and like all this you know, tore up. Is that stuff people have just taken over the years? Like they just busted the windows, took the trunk, whatever. Wow. The differentials are still in them. X frame. Gas tank's gone. Bumper's gone. Look how much paint is on those bolts. There's supposed to be four bolts and four nuts. Look, this whole uh, bundle of paint is about to come off. You can see it starting to slide down the roof. Gosh, that's so insane. That's a 56. That's a 57. That's a 58. And this is a 59 because of the way the tail fins are and the bumper. This is a 59, so 59, 8, 7, 6. And this must be a 60, 61, 62. All the years represented for like 10, 12 years here. You know, my question is, is if you dug these up, you know, what would the front end look like? You know, is it all complete? Hood, hood ornaments, bumpers, engines, all that? Is it all complete underneath the ground? That's what I want to know. Let's dig it up. Will it run and drive home? That's my next video. Well, I figure since I have a 56 myself, it's only fitting to tag my own car. So apparently, originally a group of hippies, you can look this up, from San Francisco wanted to do this project with the Cadillacs. They erected these in 1974, and they are all pointed in the direction of the Pyramid of Giza. And in 97, they were all moved two miles west. I think people forget about New Mexico, but New Mexico, in my eyes, is just as desolate as Kansas, Arkansas, or Montana. I have never been longer stretches without seeing anything, you know, as I have been in New Mexico. It is an undiscovered state. So I was driving, my generator light came on. I thought maybe it was the brush. No, it wasn't the brush. Uh, this belt is wearing real thin, you see that? And it came off actually. I opened up the hood and the belt was just chilling, like off. So oh, actually, yeah, see this belt's about to come apart. Um, actually, this is not even a big deal. Uh, this is the belt that was in the car. There was two belts in the car, one power steering and one uh, generator belt. And I decided, well, I'll use that instead of using mine. And I don't know how, they're new, but they're old. I don't know how long they were in the car. So anyway, we're just gonna put my new one on there and that's not really a big deal. But what is concerning me and well, something I'm not liking is the gas tank situation is getting worser. So that seam, that seam down there is busted, it's leaking gas out. And this bolt, this carriage bolt right here is where the gas tank is mounted, those straps and it holds up. This is about to give out. 
What I might do is maybe make some room and set the gas tank in the trunk. And in other news, this hub now is getting really warm. It's This is a lot warmer than the other side. So that's the side with the new bearing. Yay! The last leg of the trip is always the worst, so here it comes. But over here, this one has already given. See? And this is what holds my, my gas tank up. We're gonna have to make room in here because I'm gonna put it in the trunk. There's a lot of gas in here, so it's gonna be kinda heavy. So I put a hubcap on it to keep it up so that the fluid or the gas doesn't come out that seam hole right there. It's broke, but I know what happened. So this was letting it come down and the neck was being supported right here. So the, the neck was bolted to that, but the tank was trying to come down and this was the fulcrum point. So the neck was holding it, and the tank was falling, and it, it busted that seam. I gotta rearrange all my stuff. And then we can get to Albuquerque, maybe, by tonight. I don't know. This is ridiculous. generator belt is hooked back up I'm gonna check the health of my battery which brings me to the sponsor of today's video this top Don 500b battery tester is a good tool to have around the garage because it can do a lot more for you than a normal voltmeter is going to do now we're gonna do a battery test on my 56 caddy because it's been sitting a while the 500b will do regular flooded meaning lead acid AGM uh, glass mat batteries AGM special gel batteries which are like the, the Optima batteries go ahead and test it 74% which is accurate this battery is maybe three years old 65% charge this car has been sitting for a while So that's accurate voltmeter will tell you the voltage But it doesn't tell you the actual health of the battery and you only know that when you put it under load the 500 B will also do a cranking test for the battery The battery is good cranking time 11.3 volts now that's not what the battery was at sitting that's what it went down to under load that is a good thing the 500b can also do charging system tests so you can see whether your alternator your voltage regulator is going haywire or not the secret weapon on this guy is that the battery portion unplugs to reveal an obd2 tester this helps me out on my wife's car because i don't have to go to the parts store to rent their free tester anymore this portion gives you the check marks to see if you're going to pass emissions or not i am rating this it can also read codes and this one does have a current code tells you the code name tells you what the code is and it tells you that it's current make sure to click the link in the description of this video or the link in the pinned comment to pick this bad boy up on Amazon I don't think you're gonna regret it the belt wasn't off for that long so we're good 100% charge health 100% 12.9 volt battery that means that generator is doing a great job so awesome Alright, so we're in Albuquerque. I stayed last night in a uh, motel, and right now I'm at my buddy's house. A uh, guy, that family friend that me and my dad know, name's Gene. Appreciate Gene. We got a few things that we need to look over that are worrying me that might not make it back. These cars did not come with a one piece drive shaft, they got a carrier bearing. And those bolts right there are for the carrier bearing. And if you look, this drive shaft is just free floating. That carrier bearing that's in the middle there should be holding this up. And 
you know, you're doing 60, 70 miles an hour. And that thing's just trashed. So these have to come out. These have to come out. This drive shaft's got to come out and got to put a new carrier bearing in this bad boy. And also, like I was saying yesterday, this hub over here is getting hot. And if it gets hot enough, it's going to strand me because the bearing's going to burn up. So I'm going to take that hub off, which isn't really that hard, actually. And uh, I put a ton of grease in it. I don't know why it's getting hot because the other side's not. I, I did it in the same way. That side's fine. This side's getting really hot. And the temperatures are only going to be getting hotter from here on out. So I'm going to take that apart and just shove it absolutely full of grease. I had bought one like on my initial trip in part one. I had a bunch of parts sent to where I was staying. And one of the parts uh, was the carrier bearing, which is right here. And I never put it on because it was never giving me problems until now. Last leg of the trip, wouldn't you know. So what happens is, is see that's where those two bolts are that you saw? It sits like this. And this, this is the bearing, but this rubber is what goes bad. This rubber disintegrates and then it lets that do that. There she blows. So here's the carrier bearing or what's left of it. It's completely gone. I know it's hard to see, but these drive shafts come apart with a bolt. There's a bolt literally in the middle of this U-joint right here that you have to um, unloosen. And pro tip, if you ever are using a wrench and you need more leverage on that wrench, take a bigger wrench put it in the open end and there you go you got more leverage so let's play a game of will this round off <laughs> I think I got it Ow. <sighs> Hit myself in the head. Ooh. After about 30 minutes and busting my head open, I finally got this loose. So this bolt comes loose, but then it hits the U-joint. So then you have to hit this off to give you more room to loosen the bolt. And you have to do that Loosen the bolt, hit this off. Loosen the bolt, hit this off until you get the whole thing off and then this bearing comes off. Here's the old one. Here's the new one, all good to go. No more rattles and shakes and who knows what else it would have tore up. So I'll put this in there and then I'll get back with you when I jack the front up to re-grease whatever's going on up there. Got the front end jacked up. Okay. What is wrong with this side? So as soon as I took this hub off, the ball bearings fell right out of that cage. Look at that. The cage is tore up, see that? Wallered out. It's supposed to look like this. And I got this ball bearing, when I did this hub, I did this in New Jersey. I replaced this uh, race and uh, bearing assembly in New Jersey and I ordered two. Thank God I ordered two because 
I need that or I wasn't going to get home. I'm going to pound these races off, put this in, re-grease it, put this back together. I don't know if it was user error. Like, I don't know if I put it together wrong. Maybe I didn't tighten the wheel all the way and it was, you know, wiggling in there. But the outer bearing is the original bearing and it's totally fine. Um, wouldn't they both be bad if I put it together wrong? They'd both be tore up, but only the new one is. Uh, the one that's not American made. Imagine that. Look at these signs, old oil cans. And this is all the real deal, isn't it? Yeah. Don't mess with no repop stuff, huh? Bendix automotive products, I love that. Mobile gas signs. Tide all lollipop sign. High viz motor oil, mobile oil. Now these pumps, Gene, did you have them restored or did you? No, I did them. You restored them? Yeah. What year is this one from? Is this from the 40s? 39 on to the near 60. 39 on to 60. It's called a 39 Tokai. 39 Tokai. Beautiful, beautiful. I love these pumps. Those are Wayne 60s. That one right there, the tide off. The, uh, this one right here? Yeah. It's a Wayne 60. Wow, beautiful. Man, once I get me a shop built, I'm gonna start putting stuff like this in there. And you're gonna are you gonna keep those pumps as is? Yeah, those are original Route 66. Took them carrying New Mexico. So these two pumps are original Route 66 in the town of Tucumcari. Yes. They were in Tucumcari. They're MS 80s. Boy, isn't that neat? Have real Route 66 gas pumps. Back in the day, that's what you would have filled up with, man. Literally. Oh, what's that hat? What's that hat from? It's a shell hat from Germany. Oh, shell hat from, so that's what the gas attendant would have wore? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's my favorite detail. And that's what shell is in German, schultheist. I don't know what that means. Schultheist. These are uh, drive-in movie theater speakers, huh? Yeah, I just found those in Demi. Yeah, these are, uh, before you tuned in on your radio station, every single bay would have a speaker you'd put in your window and roll the window up, and this was a speaker. Yep. And this was the volume knob, I'm guessing, and you'd, yes. you'd roll your window up, and boom. You'd hook that on your window. That is cool. After a very long and taxing 12 days, we finally made it home. The 1960 Impala will run and drive 2,500 miles after sitting for over 25 years. Tomorrow we'll get Dad out here and get his professional assessment of the car. I can't believe it's sitting here. Ugh. Yeah. That motor's clean. A-frame bushings. <laughs> well, bounce the car up and down. It's so squeaky. A-frame bushings. 
needs a frame bushing. Every time I turned the wheel, I could hear it creaking oh, and yeah. you know screeching. What a car! I don't get it how it made it. What's that spark plug wire wrapped around that part of the steering? I wanted it off the manifold. I didn't want it hitting the manifold. That's a no go. Okay, well it was either that or have it ride the manifold at a thousand degrees, so I elected for that. Chevrolets are good cars, that's all I can tell you, they're good cars. I think the only piece of trim I'm missing is a, a few of the door locks and then that bottom window trim right there that wraps around. Yeah. yeah that's missing. That, that's it. And I do have some pieces in the trunk, like um, my windshield wiper. I think one of my wipers is in the trunk. I know that was a futile effort. It what, don't the, work. The wipers? Yeah. yeah I never. That was I didn't make the wipers work. That was futile. Threw some rain X on the Did that that work, didn't it? Yeah, that that rain X actually does work. Yeah, I have used that rain X. Well, you're a lucky man. I've had a few of those comments, yeah. You know. I guess the radio is a futile effort. No radio. I can't believe it made it. I'm happy it made it. Boy, I tell you, <laughs> you'd have thought that <laughs> over a period of miles it would have wore the tires out. It must be aligned decent then, because yeah. it didn't eat them up. It's a good car. Yeah, it's a good car. It's really a good car. How's it smell? Old. But if you'd have changed it, the tranny would have went. <laughs> yeah, that's about the result you'd have got. Yeah. I mean, you changed it thinking you're doing the car a big favor and you got about 200 miles down the road and the tranny would have let loose. Guarantee it. Oh man. You got all the stuff to get it home. Look, none of it fell out on the ground. Or did it? No, I don't think so. Not that I know of. I mean, the car's pretty clean, you know? I mean, the car's really clean, to tell you the truth. As old as it is, all things considered, I'd say it's pretty dang clean. No cop stopped you? No. Not a one. And I passed by a few. I, I'd say a lot of this damage came from setting up there in New Jersey. Yeah. I'd say that this car didn't have none of this on it when it got there. This car wasn't treated bad. I don't think it was either. Yeah, I think it was little old Matilda May's car. This is really clean. Even just look how the door shut. I mean, you never get this again. Even if you restored this car, took the door off, did the door rubber and all that, it would never shut like that twice. No. They're never. only original ones, and that's it. That's it. That's it. Once you touch them, they're, I don't care. They just change. The only thing that I think this car could use is a nice exhaust. <laughs> yeah. Could you smell the exhaust inside the car? Oh yeah. You grease that speedometer up? No. I just unhooked it. I heard a lot of this. Oh yeah, you did. You even probably tried to flutter the gas pedal to make the noise quiet down a little bit, didn't you? What? <laughs> you probably tried to flutter that gas pedal a little bit to get the noise to quiet down. Once you get up to speed, you know, it gets a little quieter. I'm real happy with how the brakes turned out. They, they didn't worry me at all. Bleeding them by myself was a pain. Yeah, how'd you do that? You didn't have Peter over there or something? No. Uh, what did you do, just open them up and just let them run? No, what I did was is I had that, that jack handle. Yeah. And I'd pump the brakes up, and then I'd put that bar in between the seat and the pedal. Oh, good idea. And then I'd open it up. I mean, look. It goes down the road straight. Straight as an arrow. How much gas you got? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, in all reality, I, I'm truly blown away with how sweet the motor is. The motor is very sweet. The motor runs very good. There ain't a lifter clacking or nothing. Man, here you are in this old thing. I bet you passed by a bunch of people that was broke down on the side of the road. You know what? And there you go buying an old 63-year-old car. <laughs> no, it's true. 
I was passing people in cars 40, 50 years newer. Yeah. And they were on the side of the road and I was going. <laughs> yeah, you can argue all you want, but I'm telling you, these were good cars. Well, proof is in the pudding, we're in it. Yeah. Also, Saturday, September 30th, the duct tape drags here in Tucson, Arizona at the Tucson Dragway. Dad and me are going to be at with the International, the 46 International, and I think I'm going to take the 60 Impala to that. Are you going to the duct tape drags? If you're not, go to the duct tape drags. Saturday, September 30th, we're going to be hanging out there. If you like the part one and two of this video, consider subscribing to support the channel. Like, drop a comment, leave some feedback, say something. We're always reading those and replying to those. And if you want to support the channel out in a more direct way, I've opened up channel memberships, two different tiers, some perks that you might like in there. So make sure you check the channel memberships out. It helps make more videos like this in the future. We just hit 100,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for that. Going to get the play button soon. That's a huge accomplishment. I'd rather hang that play button up than a college degree. That was a, that's hard fought. But it's all thanks to you guys for watching and viewing. And I see uh, you guys over and over in the comment section. I appreciate the return viewers. And if you're a new viewer, make sure you subscribe. 20 to 30% of my views are from subscribers. The rest are from non-subscribers. If you like the content, stick around. And we will see you guys in the next one.